Hello, uh, welcome to TCT Happy uh, 2022. And uh, the session is about a uh, live case, a coronary taped case session five, calcification and lithotripsy. I am uh, very happy to co-chair this session with uh, Dr. Byrne. And we have uh, uh, four nice uh, specialized panelists, uh, Yong Ming Han, uh, Bruno Scheller, Xiong Zhen Wu, and Robert Ye. Uh, and we will see two cases, uh, one from Humanitas Research Hospital by Antonio Colombo, and the second one by San Francisco Hospital and Heart Center by Ziad Ali. Let's begin first by our first case. Uh, Professor Colombo, please. Hello, uh, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, I wish everybody a, a, an educational uh, session. So let me go uh, and present uh, my case. Uh, so uh, we are talking we are dealing with a 70 years old uh, gentleman, uh, standard risk factors, hypertension, dyslipidemia, smoking, mild carotid disease, no diabetes, BMI is 25. Uh, the clinical history is important for the uh, six cycle uh, or a C uh, of uh, radiotherapy. Uh, he has a major bleeding in 2017, gastric lesion, malory vice. In 2022, uh, recently he had an episode of uh, heart failure, severe heart failure, and now he has an effort uh, dyspnea angina, New York class uh, 3 uh, regarding heart failure. Uh, ECG shows uh, uh, sinus rip, left bundle branch block with a very large QRS, 150, and uh, the history of, love failure, of heart failure is confirmed by the high BNP close to 2000. He has a normal uh, creatinine. Uh, you see a ventricle uh, very dilated, and diastolic volume 165, ejection fraction 20%. There is uh, some uh, RB dysfunction with the TAPS uh, of 16 uh, and some mitral regurgitation and tricuspid. The pulmonary pressure is 60. So uh, I think it's evident that uh, the motion of the left ventricle is uh, uh, markedly reduced. Uh, the right corner is a small uh, vessel. Um, nothing remarkable. There is some disease proximally, but uh, uh, is not uh, a particular interest in this uh, presentation. The left system is a dominant uh, system, and uh, you see a, a diffuse calcified LAD. And I believe uh, in, in fashion that this patient may have had in the past. Uh, uh, is the cause of the diffuse hypokinesia addressing uh, the left ventricle. The circumflex uh, is okay. The left main is very short, uh, almost a dual, uh, dual origin. Uh, the uh, MRI confirmed uh, uh, intramyocardial fibrosis. There is no previous MI, but um, I'm not so sure. Uh, about these uh, findings because uh, I have no other explanation uh, for the uh, diffuse hypokinesia in the anterior wall. So uh, the discussion here is uh, surgery versus PCI. Uh, if you do PCI protected PCI, uh, I think uh, medical therapy considering uh, the importance of this left anterior descending uh, is uh, probably out. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, would you do some kind of plaque modification, debulking, uh, lesion preparation? 
I assume uh, that uh, lesion preparation is essential considering uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, situation. Uh, here we are in the uh, CAT lab. Uh, we decided to do uh, a protected PCI because of the low uh, ejection fraction and uh, uh, need of uh, extensive plaque modification in the left anterior descending. We are gaining access. You see a big uh, introducer uh, being placed because we plan uh, to put uh, in Pella uh, system. Uh, we uh, prepared uh, the vessel, the femoral artery with the uh, proglide. And uh, now we have uh, an 18 wire already placed uh, in the left ventricle and we are inserting uh, the uh, CP impeller catheter. Uh, we use uh, the same access uh, to do the PCI procedure. So you see the puncture of the membrane of the valve. Uh, with the impeller, you can uh, utilize as introducer uh, to uh, deploy the guiding catheter to a sheet. You can use a seven French or a six French. In this case, we take advantage uh, to use a seven French. And uh, so now we have a single axis, one for the impeller and one for the guiding catheter, seven French guiding catheter. You see the impeller position in the left ventricle. And now Dr. Reimers joined me in uh, the procedure. I believe there is a uh, no much question about the extensive classification of the left anterior descending. We uh, uh, try to advance an IVUS uh, catheter, uh, but the IVUS does not progress. Uh, not a surprise, you just see the proximal segment, but uh, nothing uh, uh, distal. So this is a almost universal sign uh, that uh, even if you can go with balloons, uh, you need something different. And that's the reason why we do this wire exchange using a microcatheter and place a rotablator wire. In general, we prefer the soft uh, rotablator wire and uh, considering that uh, we have a tight uh, lesion, uh, we will use uh, a 1.5 burr. If it's very, very tight, uh, you can consider using a 125, but in this case, uh, we, pref we opted for a, a 1.5 burr. Uh, here you see the check uh, of the rotablator. Um, I think to have the Ampella um, catheter is a luxury because you can uh, really do a very protected uh, procedure. The rotablator does not have much difficulties to cross uh, the calcific segment. This is a very small burr considering the size of this vessel, which is definitely over 3.5. Uh, so there are other options you can consider. You can consider to use a bigger burr you can consider to use uh, uh, orbital aterectomy or uh, some other procedure like lithotripsy. After rotational aterectomy, we can now perform IVUS and uh, we start from distal segment. You see the vessel is very large. There is some calcium in this area, not a lot, uh, mainly here some more. There is some fracture, you can see. It's not 360 degrees, but in some area is over 180 and you see various fractures. Here is more extensive. Here is more, you are in the mid of the calcified lesion. So the vessel size is one, two, three, almost four millimeter. So there is uh, some uh, discontinuity in the calcium, but considering the size 
of this vessel, I think uh, this is not uh, is not sufficient. Uh, so uh, this is for discussion, but we already went through this severe classification. I will show nodular culture after uh, rota, and we don't expect that the rota would have done much except making the way for the ibus catheter. So at this point, uh, we could use larger balloon, as we said, larger burr, another type of aterectomy, like uh, orbital aterectomy, uh, or IVL stands for intravascular lithotripsy. I think when you're dealing with these big vessels, uh, uh, lithotripsy is really uh, the way uh, to go. Uh, at this point, uh, we placed uh, a wire in the circumflex. Uh, the circumflex is not disease. We are not planning to do any bifurcation uh, or at least uh, two stains, but uh, to have an additional wire in such a dominant circumflex gives some uh, security. So we are now uh, dilating, uh, pre-dilating a little bit to get uh, the uh, shockwave balloon go through. This balloon is uh, not, uh, not so small, so uh, we prepared uh, the lesion uh, a little bit more aggressively with the balloon to make room uh, uh, for the uh, lithotripsy catheter to advance. Uh, you don't really want to struggle to advance the lithotripsy catheter uh, in, uh, in the vessel. So these are just the pre-dilatation to make uh, room uh, for the lithotripsy catheter to go smooth without uh, much <coughs> resistance. We did uh, uh, lithotripsy in various uh, areas. Uh, is not uh, shown, but uh, the lithotripsy cast uh, went very well. And now you see a long, uh, a long stent uh, being deployed in uh, the proximal part of the LED. This is a 3.5. drug eluting stent. Here you see the pole dilatation at a high pressure, 3.5 20 atmosphere. In various segments, the balloon expands very well. That confirmed that the lesion was appropriately prepared. These 3.5 balloon at 20 atmospheres, is, uh, even if it's non compliant, uh, is uh, close to four. Here you see the calcium has been pushed uh, toward the adventitia. The lumen uh, is uh, very nice after a long stent on the LED. At this point, is a master to repeat IVUS. If there is some area that is under expanded, you can do another dilatation and you can even use lithotripsy after implanting uh, the stent. Uh, this is a unique feature. We start with the ibus distally. The vessel is four millimeter, it's really big vessel. Okay, this is the distal part of the stent. I would say that uh, looks uh, well expanded, maybe in the distal part an additional dilatation would be appropriate. Uh, yeah, it's a little bit asymmetric, but uh, overall uh, we have a lumen uh, that uh, to measure by eyeballing is over eight. Here yeah, it's very circular, you see that uh, the calcium has been uh, fragmented uh, sufficiently. Here we are in the mid, uh, of the lesion where there was more calcium and uh, here in the left main you saw the uh, circumflex 
coming before. So I think maybe uh, we need some uh, additional delegation more distally. Um, but overall, uh, we are uh, we are satisfied. As, as I said, we go with another balloon to do an additional delegation more distally where the Argus result was not particularly. And in this case, as a matter of fact, we took another little tripsy catheter to uh, better expand the lesion in the distal part. This is a 3.5 litre tripsy catheter in the distal segment. And we go outside the stent a little bit, so we will need to implant an additional stent. You can do uh, eight uh, cycle with uh, one uh, with one balloon. We are in the distal part of the implant stent and a little bit outside the stent. At this point, uh, we'll repeat uh, IVUS. to confirm that the distal area has been well prepared. Here we are in the healthy part of the vessel. Lumen is fine, there is no need here to do anything. We are moving toward the diseased area. There is some calcium here, a nodular calcium. You see a lot of shadowing. Mainly is nodular calcium, and here is the distal part of the stent. So, as I said, we need an additional, not long stent, more distal. You saw a stent boost to better locate the end of the previous stent, and this is a 3.5, 15 millimeter stent to be added. We almost always post dilate the stent, even if the lesion has been well prepared. And here we post dilate at the overlap section. And we repeat an IBUS at the very end, hopefully. You see the distal part of the vessel looks fine some calcium here, but the lumen is well preserved. And here the distal stent that is well deployed even. I mean, the nodular calcium makes some asymmetry, but I believe it's very acceptable. You see that how round symmetry so this is a real combination of different device, what ablator, high pressure balloon, lithotripsy, and it's not easy to get an optimal result with one single device. There are some areas where the lumen is large, but is not completely round because when you have nodular calcium, it's not always possible to get a perfect symmetry. These are the final injections. You see a very nice flow. Having uh, the impella catheter, you can really, there is an additional dissection. It's not a bad dissection, but uh, Dr. Reimers wanted to add an additional stain more distally. Uh, so I think in this case, to add an additional stain, gives the procedure more safety. As I said, it's not a, a very a bad dissection, but uh, I think uh, in a patient with such a low ejection fraction, you don't want to take any risk. And to add an additional stent distally is uh, 
uh, this more safety to the procedure. I must say that uh, this uh, dissection was more evident on angiography, not uh, so clear on uh, uh, IVUS. And that's another reason never rely on one single uh, diagnostic tool. So after the distal stent, uh, we repeat the IVUS. Here you see, here is the total healthy area. We're going to see very shortly the stand just placed. So the stand lands in a healthy vessel. So you saw the perfect symmetry. And we're just going to look at the distal part because we already saw the proximal. And I think here we already saw this area from the prior stand. You see the nodular calcium that gives a certain asymmetric stent expansion. And I think we move quickly to end uh, uh, this IVUS run, which uh, is basically uh, repetitious uh, of the previous one. Uh, here we are in the more proximal part uh, where there was a lot of calcium, but the volumen is uh, well, uh, well achieved, uh, definitely over eight uh, square millimeters. Uh, Very soon we will be doing a final angle. So the impeller was not, in my opinion, a must, but uh, having the luxury, you see the final result, you see how really the stent are optimally expanded with a good flow, uh, despite multiple uh, procedures. Uh, the dilatation, post dilatation preparation, there is no impairment on distal flow. And this is particularly thanks to the impeller system. And now we do the final removal. So we put a, a proglide and we have to add an angio seal because there was an additional leak. And here you see the angio seal eight French being deployed inside the uh, hole, partially closed with one proglide. And hopefully this extra uh, closure device, Androsil, will be sufficient. And the team says hello, and uh, I thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you. Uh... Antonio, it was uh, really uh, an incredible case, huh? one of the most calcified uh, artery I ever saw. Huh? And um, we will have all the questions at the end of the session. So let me uh, ask now uh, to Dr. Ziad Ali to present his case coming from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center. Dr. Ali, please. Thank you so much, Professor Maurice. So what we've done is provide a recording of our entire case, which is um, actually moderated by Alan Jeremias and I. So I'll ask the moderators to play the case, please. Hey guys, it's Ziad and Alan from San Francis. Let me show you this case real quick. Um, very, very calcified mid-RCA, high-grade stenosis. Truly eccentrically, truly eccentrically, likely a nodule. When, when we see these eccentric calcifications, usually it's a nodule. So our strategy typically with a nodule is to do CSI, which we have done, and uh, did a small balloon afterwards. Um, and this is the, the OCT post. The, so uh, let me walk you through the MLD Max approach, okay? So morphologically, obviously heavily calcified, very, very eccentric lesion. I just want to focus you in on perhaps what may be um, one of the best examples of uh, CSI atherectomy. I mean, look at this. It's just shaved this nodule down almost completely, extremely smooth. So show uh, the nodule a little bit for, further distal where it's still And so the and problem intact. is we're right the, here, in the right eruptive here. component of the That's nodule, it. we haven't really shaved a lot off. You can see by ballooning, we've got a deep dissection. And so, but we did do a, a number of low speed runs and kind of really focused in there. But I think what's happening is jumping forwards and backwards. You can see that our distal reference here uh, is measured at um, 3.68. 
Our proximal reference out of 23 is measured at um, going to be something similar. 3.57. So we have a 3.523 stent. But first, what we're going to do is go back with a 3.25 NC balloon and see if we can crack this. If not, um, we're going to use a shockwave balloon. So and, there's and new the data, data on and this. And the data is somewhat controversial for shockwave in a nodule, right? But we had had some success with it. I guess, you know, the latest data, yep, come back a little bit. The latest data is showing that it's equally effective. That's 20. So what's happening here, like I just want open, right? yeah, the I wanna, problem with I wanna show you here this, that what's happening is we're getting an eccentric balloon dilation in the fibrous part of the artery. Come back a little bit. And so you can see that there's a segment of ca calcium even on the angiogram that's very, very thick on the inner curve that we really haven't modified at all. And so you can see that, that sort of dog bone here again. Yeah. So I think you what we're going to do how, is... How about a different view? You want to take yeah, a... Yeah, sure. Let's just Remember, see how this it, is how a highly it. eccentric lesion. So I think what we're going to do is go ahead and do a shockwave on this. So Correct. you want to uh, talk through this uh, highly complex uh, connection? Yeah, I, li I love the red thing on top. Okay, so uh, Susan, if you can show what we've got here. This, voila, is a shockwave balloon. It's got one connector... Right, so the one connector will connect to the shockwave device, to the catheter, will connect directly to the shockwave device, and it's got a balloon port for flushing. Well, let's and, show this part, which is the important part, right? So you have a sleeve. Okay, so this is arguably the most difficult part. Yeah, I never do that. Right, and so what we're going to do is take our balloon out. So you can see uh, what Medulla is doing is handing over... And the front part, sort of the condom part of this at the very proximal edge with an arrow on it, is the part that we're going to um, put the rubber bands on first because it's slightly too big for the hole. So if you don't do this early on enough, what will end up happening is you can uh, potentially unsterilize it. Yeah, the tricky part is when you are pulling off the tip, right? But is just showing off now. Yes, she really is. Okay. Unbelievable. Look at this, man. Okay, so... Um, you you want to just give us a scissors or a knife? No, no, it has a spoke. Yeah, I know, but I I prefer not to do that because then the hole gets too big. So the red cap is off. And there's only one way to connect. There's only so one I'm, way I'm, to connect even it. Even Ziad can do it, guys. Okay. So we're connected. Is the shockwave power on? What I like to do once it's connected is get this sleeve a little bit out, so this way you know you covered everything. Okay, right so when the shockwave turns on, it's telling us that we have um, 80 pulses, our catheter and a 3512. When the when you're on standby mode, kind of like at a flashlight, um, you, you're on amber, and when you um, click therapy, it will turn green, meaning you're ready to shock. The balloon is prepped like a regular balloon, which we're doing now in the back. Now, one thing that's very important with the shockwave balloon is you really have to be very careful not to get air in the balloon um, because you, you need the ionic component of the media to deliver the electrical energy to the wall. So if you have air, you'll lose that. Ionic media. Yeah. The, the so I'll, I like that. The ionic contrast media. I'll bring that up tonight at dinner. You know, if you have a non-contrast, uh, non-ionic contrast, the shockwave won't work? Really? Yep. So in Germany, they use non-ionic contrast. If you put it in, you press the button, it doesn't do anything. Nothing happens. That's cool. Very nice. Okay. Let's see how it delivers. It's a little bit bulkier than an NC balloon, but we do have a guideliner, so it should go okay. So about 20% of the cases need a guideliner, and so this isn't going across, so we might have to inchworm this across and then unsheath it. Not unusual. Let's see if I get the guy ladder in a bit more to help us here. No. No. Okay. So what we're going to do is take the shockwave out, and we'll have the NC balloon back, please. The, uh, with the last one that you gave us. Sure. So overall... Um, the registry data and the trials are showing that you need some type of ancillary device to help you cross in about 20% of cases. Um, this is a tight lesion you saw with the calcium, so it kind of makes sense that that's the case. I'm going to protect our shockwave balloon. 
So very early on after we did our atherectomy, we had quite a bit of ST elevations, probably from what was a dissection. Uh, they have now resolved. More or less. So maybe we'll take a chance to talk about pulse management, and that is, you know, when you have a long diffuse calcified lesion, what we try to do is we try to use our pulses, about 40 of them in the lesion, uh, watch the, uh, the vessel actually yield, and then after we use our first 40 pulses, we use the remainder of the 40 pulses elsewhere around the vessel in the calcified segment, um, because uh, it often the minimal calcified, uh, minimal stent area is in a, another area of the heavily calcified vessel. Let me rewrap this. You have a new three, um, five or three. What do you have in the room? Balloon was. NC. Okay. All right. Let's rewrap it and see if it goes. I'm just gonna rewrap this. So go to sit. We'll just wait for one second, Casey. No. No. Okay. We'll take that new balloon. Just doesn't enter the lesion. Wow. Yeah. Three five is great. So it puts things in perspective. The shockwave is not such a bad balloon, right? Even yeah. the regular NC doesn't well, go. You know, although it has been pre-used. Um, it's slightly larger than an NC balloon. Uh, it's very similar in size to uh, a, a the specialty balloons. No such thing as an easy calcified lesion, Dr. Jeremiah. I guess. Yeah, I get it this? also shows you nicely that, that uh, even when you do rotational or orbital atherectomy, doesn't mean that uh, game is over, right? You still have to do more work sometimes. And this is the problem where I think sometimes we get into the situation where you just do the atherectomy, you don't take a look, you just jam a stent, and you still up and end up underexpanded. Yeah. Okay, so Alan's going to show you the uh, balloon-assisted tracking technique here. So what I'm going to do is, because we don't need a lot of dilation here, I'm just going to go up gently, and Alan's going to bring the balloon in, uh, the guideliner in. Okay. And so what I'm going to do is I come down, he's going to push, try to sheath this balloon. And he's done a pretty good job at it, I think. Well, I think we have to go more. Yeah. See if we can come around the spend fully. All right, go up again. Going a little bit more. I think I'm gonna, that's ballooning the guideline or still. Yeah. Okay, good. So, you know, again, I'm not going too too high here because all I need is a little bit of traction for Alan to be able to get around. All right, go down. Okay. Ten for ten. No, it doesn't go around here. Okay. Watch your guide. Maybe what we should do is let's go back with this with the new NC balloon next and then see if the NC will okay. crack enough to get the guideline on sure. I mean, I can go higher with this too. You want to try? Why don't you try? No, it just doesn't no. take that. Okay, that watch turn. your guide. Getting a little AR. All right. You know what we could do? Why don't you cr straddle the lesion? Put half the balloon in. Yeah. Come back a little bit. Bring your guideliner back. How about here? Yeah, but bring cool. your guideliner back, and then because we need a run, r like some uh, runway to it. Okay. Bit more. That's better. Come the balloon back. Get the three O and C next, please. Okay. Uh, Ready? Yeah. No. Okay. All right. Let's do the three O and see if that works. Well, no. Well, there's some unused balloon. Three five is unused. Three two five is used. Three two five is used. Let's use this three five. There it goes. I think it goes around. Wow. Holy shit. That's a hell of a corner. Yes, okay. that made all the difference. Good example of what you need to do to get across. We'll have the shockwave balloon, please. So six French compatible. We should get the balloon across nicely. This is good, okay. right? Yeah, I like I'm that. I'm going to unsheath it. I'm gonna we, don't, we don't have to start so distal. So let me just come back a little bit. But don't come across it, of course. This yeah. is always the balloon regret. Yeah, so this should be good right here. So you want to talk about the emitters? Yeah, the okay. Emitters so there are... are inside the dots, right? Yep. So go ahead and press therapy. There's two emitters. The first emitter is six millimeters proximal to the distal marker. Okay. So I'm up at four, and we're going to start delivering shocks. Off fluoro, please, Alan. On fluoro. 
You can see actually the dog, dog bone nicely here. It looks like it's opening. It's right? opening, yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, so what I tried to do is I tried to put, I was trying to position the proximal emitter right on the lesion. And then what I'm going to do now is come back a little bit for each Let's of the... Let's do one more here because we well, have so much space. Just, okay. Usually so what, many I, shots what I do. like to do is just come back, you know, a millimeter or two just to have the emitters in different positions within yeah. the lesion. But basically there's two sets of emitters. You see there is a little air in there, which is not ideal, yeah. but... Also, I didn't see the spike on the EKG, which is unusual, right? Normally, you expect to see a spike. Yeah. So, all right, let's, let's try this. You see how the air is moving around? Now we have the spikes. That's why, that's the problem when you have the air. What? Is that the all of the conductance is going through the bubbles. So, why don't we reprep this? We need to reprep this. this. Yeah. It looks, there's only one bubble here. Yeah. But you'll see what's going to happen with this bubble. Let me fluoro up the mag. So as we deliver this fluoro, you're going to see what's going to happen. The balloon's going to, the bubble starts moving around. Yeah. Now there's two. Yeah. Yeah. So let's deliver a little Just bit of, me, give me, what, a, give me a that, few please. pulses. Um, a little bit more proximal around that bend as well. Wow, you're really working hard here. Yeah. Okay, so you can see I'm really going negative to suck back. But it just goes to show how important the prep for this device is. All right, so let me just come back a little bit. Okay. I like it. All right. So now the more distal emitters are right on Look that at that module. prep medulla. It's not play school. <laughs> I mean, he's out of breath. It's he's, not play he worked, school. He worked 15 minutes. Look at the balloon. It's beauty. It took eight inflations to get it. Fuck, we got it. Hey, you All know right. what? You got to do what you got to do. We'll take it. So you, you need 10 seconds in between each set of shocks. That's a, a reminder to you to, to deliver uh, some. Are you doing it again? Go. It's oh, opening. Up. Yeah, I think we're good. I think it's opening. So all we should do is let me come back a little bit. We'll do one more run, and then I like to keep maybe, you know, 10 or so, okay. 10, 10, 20 pulses just in case you need it later. So let's do a final set. So I'll go to 8 here. I'll try not to pop the balloon. But it looks like it's it wide open. It looks much better. Yeah. yeah. Floral? Oh, so yeah. what I'm going to do okay. is I'm going to actually advance the liner over this and then okay. and then get ready for the stand. Yep. Uh, do you mind if we OCT? I'd love to see what the shockwave did. Okay, then I'm not going to do that. Yep, don't do that. OCT, please. Shockwave coming out. Yeah, I'll no, do one. Okay. We're, you know what? Let us do our OCT and then we'll do it because we have a guideliner and we want to suck air back and all that. Jazz. We'll go one more. Let's go to sure. this mag here. Yeah. This is good. Thing is flying, wah, wah, flying wah, wah, wah. around the corner. All you right. like it, Susan Thomas? We're getting a little she excited here. She loves it. Here. She loves it. All right, that's puff. gonna be good. Give it a little puff. I did. Just push oh, this. Yeah, it's like. So I'm just gonna clear the inside. Good. Ready? Yeah. Go. Wow. Even angiographically, the shockwave made yeah, a huge difference. It did. You, could I could I tempt you to advance the guideliner a little bit and take one more picture? Yeah. Given we got so much yeah. nerd. Oh wow. That's crazy. Wow, wow, we wow. Oh, it's fractured the nodule. Yeah. It really did. Do you want to do one more? Yeah, I definitely want to do one more. Advance okay, wait. Let more. me get the guide in better. Oh, that's perfect. I'm going to use a bigger syringe. That's good. G give the whole dye. Fill it up. Okay. Fill, fill it up with dye. <laughs> oh, we need a really good picture I, I can't inject otherwise. I don't have hands okay. like a gorilla. You want me to do it? No. 
Susan, he needs bigger hands. Can I you need, get him some bigger hands? I mean, you know, you, you have I mean, to, come on, man. I mean, like, talk to, about limitations here. <laughs> with what you have. Let's go. <laughs> Ready? Now, that's what I'm talking You've about. You've never seen a bad hour CT. Okay, on. now that's the type of picture that's, cha that's changing the game. All right, we'll take the stent. Okay, so what I want to show you here as we go through is you're going to see there's a fracture. There's mul there's You see the fracture in the nodule? I'll show you this. Medulla. So I'm just going to... Okay. So, and then I'll, so here, I'll let's start from distally, you, okay? Did we decide on the stent length, guys? 23 or 28? Okay, so so here we've got a good uh, otherwise expansion. You can see that there's a sh fracture at about let's, let's 4 o'clock. Big fracture up here at 11 o'clock. And this is what's very exciting. Look at this fracture, deep fracture into the calcified nodule. Yeah. I mean, that is incredible. You can see actually the cut right on top L look from at the that. CSI, and then you see the crack. Look at this fracture nodule. deep into the nodule. Okay, Alan Jeremiah. That's pretty interesting. Uh, I think. I'm uh, excited, man. I, I'm. Pretty confident the stent will go. Uh, me too. You know, this is supportive of, of the most recent data that suggests that even in eccentric calcified nodules, this will work. There is no way on earth that a balloon could create that fracture. No. Impossible. Maybe Three, a balloon that goes to 60 atmospheres. But even then, I think it would just tear the other side of the artery. Three five will do this. It's fine. Yeah, thanks. Oh, that that's so it's a lack of butter. Wait, let's just see where we are. I think I have to go a bit more, but let's make sure. I like it. That's in the calcified segment. Let's see. Helps to have the guide in when you take a picture. Well, you know, I mean, I just you don't want to make it too easy just for, for yourself. Just for future reference, in case you do a case. Let's come back. Come to the proximal edge of that calcium. Yes, See that? Yes. Of course, the stent is stuck now. You want to take it? No, I'd like to come back a little if I can. I don't want to strip it, but let's see if I can come back just a little more. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, I'm going to take that. There we go. That's pretty nice. 14. Wow. 16. Don't go crazy. Let's do a okay. three, NC five, balloon, please. Three, five, yep. NC. You, did you see that prep? I went to town on it. You know, let's. it's not play school. This, this is the big leagues. Yeah, you literally were out of breath. <laughs> that was the workout for the day. Come here back a little back bit. Here. I think this is good, right? Going or no? Let's see. Is the device detection on? It's missing it. It's missing it a little bit. You want to um, re redo our device detection? Okay. Never mind. I think okay. it's good. Let's take this. Side. 20. Is it? Oh, I like that. I have, a, I have a little room proximal. Yeah. And you can see what we did is we did it, used our pulse management to try to get all the calcified segment. How, how? Come back. You got a lot of room. Oh, I have a lot back. of room, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Watch your guideliner. Do this. Going up. Yeah. 22. You got another four millimeters or so. Yeah. 22 for eight. Honestly, I got, you got to love technology. We've got device detection on this side. We're shock waving. We re I did atherectomy. I don't think you know, anybody likes technology as much as you do. I really, I you really do like it. Like, I got, I like, gotta say, like a teenage Latucci kid. likes like it. Like a teenage kid. Latucci loves it. All right, I think this is good. Twenty-two. We'll do the OCT next. Twenty-two four eight. Watch it just work. Alan's uh, going retrograde. I'm going retrograde.
So, a little thing with wires. This is a Xion Blue. And one of the, I love this wire, my favorite wire. Except oh, you the, didn't. The one downside of the Xion Blue is when you go to 20 plus atmospheres. And I'm a 20 plus atmospheres type of guy. And you are. It binds, the balloon binds on so the So let wire. me explain why that happens. There is the inner core of the Xion Blue, the core to tip is 0 0.09. But the outside casing is 0 0.14. So when you squeeze with a 20 plus atmosphere pressure balloon, the 014 on top of the 009, it basically squeezes the 014 like a wrench squeezing down, and that's where it gets stuck. No. Yeah. You get that? No, but I just know that <laughs> the Xion Blue and high atmospheres are not friends. That's all I need to know, really. All right, I'm ready to roll. I told you we should put the guide extender in. Well, we have to check the proximal edge. So let me come out actually a little bit and make sure we're okay there. A lot of chatter. Okay, well. So why don't you put your guide extender in? Let's do one more run and then we'll do the proximal edge. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll inject. Don't do it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you hold the catheter, Alan, please. Let's flush the catheter. Okay. All right, I'm ready. Just, if you if you can avoid dissecting the vessel, it'd be great. Don't worry. I can I can do this. Okay. Ready? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the reason I really went to Home Depot is to see, I wanted to get a pick, pickup truck, right? It's a manly thing to do, so I wanted to see how I hold up at Home Depot. But after the trip, I decided to get into truck. Can't handle the truck. The small dissection okay. proximity yeah, was pretty right. good. Can you show us... It looks really good there, Can you actually. show us a distal edge? Tiny dissection distally. Yeah, something we can leave alone. I think even the proximal, we're a little malopposed. Yeah. Hey, Susan, how am I well, doing next it's, door? It's malopposed because you know I didn't. I, I, yeah. I kind of missed the proximal millimeter. But honestly, I, but I wouldn't even bother I wouldn't with touch it. it. No. no nice, nice job, Doctor Jeremiah. Very nice results. We'll take that. Look at this we'll last take shot. That any day. Look at this last shot. That's a beauty. That really is a big vessel. Thanks for joining us. Until next time. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. It was two uh, incredible case cases. Um, maybe we can begin the discussion now on uh, on the first case, the LAD uh, uh, with uh, uh, of uh, Dr. Colombo. Uh, I, I I begin. Uh, Antonio, you uh, you use a rotablator first. Um, is it uh, because you were uh, you knew that the the lithotripsy catheter would not cross? Yes, absolutely. If the IVUS catheter does not cross, uh, it's almost uh, unheard that the, the lithotripsy will cross. So you could have tried uh, with a small balloon and make uh, your way instead of rotablator, but uh, with the luxury of the impeller one rotablator passage uh, makes uh, everything easier. Thank you. Do, does I, I have, yeah, yeah, please. I, I have one question. Uh, Dr. Colombo, yeah, yeah, your procedure is always fantastic, so perfect. So, but uh, I have one question about the, in, in such a kind of case, the LED is very, LED is very tight, looks tight, but so complex is not that looks normal, but ejection fraction is 20% uh, global or motion of normality. So the, how can we, how can you confirm that the uh, low ejection fraction is due to, low ejection due to coronary problem? Mm -hmm. 
But uh, you know that's uh, that's a very appropriate question, and uh, the MRI uh, did not uh, show signs of uh, uh, myocardial infarction. But uh, I'm not so sure mm. that uh, we can really trust uh, this finding because uh, uh, I've no other explanation why the anterior wall uh, has to be so akinetic. Uh, so. Sometimes the test uh, can make a mistake. So can I, can I, uh, Mary? So that uh, rota tripsy, Antonio. Uh, for me, it seems like if you want to create somewhat uh, lumen for this case, maybe for example, increase your birth size, for example, a little bit one seventy five, or maybe two millimeter to just kind of debarking first. You have Impera on board, so that can be, you know, sometime, you know, improve your lumen then followed by shock, but little, you know, like a rotor tripsy, but this is an expensive procedure. But what do you think, you know, increase your birth size at the beginning? I, I think there's nothing wrong to go with the 175 after the 1.5. That's what we used to do two or three years ago. Uh, but uh, I think uh, with the little tripsy available, uh, it's uh, it's quick uh, to you know because even a 175 is going to mm -hmm. be very small for this vessel. Mm -hmm. you know, we did uh, uh, ten years ago. We were mm -hmm. using 225 bursts mm -hmm. uh, with an eight French catheter, yeah. uh, even a nine French. But uh, you know it gives. Uh, too much distal embolization, even if you have the impeller, is not, uh, it's not a friendly procedure anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, you have to use a terectomy, this type only for what is needed Very and to one. use modern mm -hmm. approach. Mm -hmm. So only create the lumen for this or tripsy. Yes, yes, Let's, I think. Yeah. Uh, and right. when so much calcium, you, it's impossible to, to send the calcium enough, you need to break. And the only way to break the calcium is uh, the shock wave, unless in the future we'll have some other technology. Uh, yes, Dr. Chanel? Like, yes, I like your procedure very much using impeller, using the sheath of the impeller for, for, for access to the kernel. This is great. Uh, and I, I think using first interblader and then shockwave is the best combination we can do. However, from a reimbursement perspective, it's a mess. So this is, um, this is my, my concern for this. And what I want to ask you is what, what role do you see for uh, specialty balloons like cutting, scoring balloon before and after uh, shockwave? I think we use uh, we use cutting balloon sometimes after the shock wave. You know, it's uh, uh, as uh, as Dr. Ziad and Jeremy uh, uh, pointed out. When the calcium is nodular, uh, is very difficult to get a good result with a pressure balloon. We have OPN balloon. They go to 40, but if the calcium is nodular, you just squeeze the other side of the vessel, which is no good. And you may even create rupture. So uh, I think a, a cutting balloon, uh, when it's nodular, it's okay, but it's not, uh, it's not the best. I mean, cutting balloon uh, is, is okay. It's a poor man shock wave, I call it. If you don't have shock wave, if you cannot afford, you can try cutting balloon. Uh, uh, Antonio, your age, uh, patient ejection fraction was extremely low and you were treating a very dominant LAD and there was uh, near no, no right coronary artery. Was the impella enough? Uh, did, did your procedure went well without uh, a drop of pressure? Was the support of the impella uh, enough to uh, make? Oh yeah, make yeah. The, yeah. The procedure, the procedure went. Uh, we didn't have to use any pressure agent. Uh, the blood pressure never went below one hundred. And we removed, as uh, you saw, the impel at the end of the procedure. We keep yeah. the patient overnight in the coronary care unit. I think uh, 
interesting will be to check in one month uh, to see if there is any improvement in the ventricular function. Yeah. I'm not I'm not 100% sure that is, I mean, not even 50% sure that this will happen. Eh? Maybe we just did a cosmetic procedure. I hope not, but. Uh, no, of course we all hope, and uh, yeah, you were. But I'm not. Uh, Let's say it I'm was not... the only opportunity for this yeah. patient to improve, huh? because uh, yes. if this doesn't improve the ejection fraction, it means that. I, I think uh, the cost benefit, uh, the procedure was safe, uh, and even if there is only thirty percent chance, I think uh, I will. If I were the patient, I will take yeah. a thirty percent chance. No, no, completely agree. One question for Zia is uh, because you are showing that uh, eccentric and calcium nodule, but this is uh, how often you can actually, like this case, perfectly creating by shockwave, but some other case you need, uh, you know, combination with orbital, uh, with uh, shockwave, or maybe on top, like Antonio, to a rotabrator tripsy that can help a crack, crack, cracking this kind of uh, very calcified eccentric nodule. So um, we presented this data at TCT uh, in 2021. So whether or not you have a calcified nodule or whether or not you have an eccentrically calcified lesion, both the minimal stent area and the stent expansion compared to the other groups, i.e. non-calcified nodule or concentric, they're the same. So it turns out by intravascular imaging, there are actually three types of calcified nodules. There's a calcified nodule, which is like a piece of popcorn on top of jello. So when you push the nodule down, it gets pushed into the jello and the stent expands beautifully. That's when you use an NC balloon and you see the nodule disappear and there's no dent in the balloon. That's type one, that's 33% of cases. The next 33% of cases are the popcorn, but it's actually sitting on a big plate of calcium. In those situations, the intravascular lithotripsy fractures the calcium underneath the popcorn and lets you push it. It allows true vascular compliance. The third type is the most difficult, and that is the glacier. So actually the calcium is coming and peaking all the way from the base and is very thick, typically more than one millimeter. There is no good therapy for that because as Antonio showed very elegantly, unless you use an extremely large burr, you will only cut the very peak mm -hmm. off of that nodule. So as soon as you put your stent in, the nodule will tend to want to bias again towards the stent and either pop through it or create a restenosis and recoil. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, you, your differentiation, uh, your description is very important. So can you differentiate the three types of calcification nodule in vivo? I mean, by ultrasound or by OCT, can you uh, differentiate the three types? So you have to use OCT compared with IBIS because uh, IBIS cannot tell this kind of three yeah. types. Yeah, I would agree uh, with Dr. Wu. So in our experience from the core lab, um, IBIS is unable to differentiate the different types of nodules. And unfortunately, OCT will allow you to group the 66% of lesions that have the popcorn type lesion and the 33%, which are the glacier, because they look different. The glacier looks pointed and the popcorn looks has small bits of fibrin on it, which typically is what we call an eruptive calcific nodule. The problem is none of them will let you know whether the, the calcium is deep underneath and whether you need to fracture it or whether a balloon works. But what we've now done in our practical approach of calcification is if we see the eruptive calcific nodule, our first approach now is to use a balloon. If we use a balloon and we see complete expansion, we're confident that the nodule will get pushed into the plaque and we'll just go ahead and with an NC balloon and then stent. But if we see that the balloon remains dented, then we'll use lithotripsy to fracture the calcium underneath it before placing our stent. 
as I mentioned, the unmet need really is still the glacier, which um, as you saw in our case, we were able to actually fracture. Unfortunately, that's more the exception rather than the rule. As you all know, as your experience grows with intravascular lithotripsy, and actually based on our core lab data, once the calcium gets to more than a millimeter thick, it's very hard to fracture it with a current IVL balloon. Um, Antonio Ziad, uh, two great uh, cases, uh, nice uh, examples, good issues to compare and contrast. I wonder if I might ask both of you, in terms, you touched on it uh, during discussion of the case, but in terms of distributing your pulses, um, do you have uh, a, a, any tips and tricks on that? I know Ziad, you alluded to one way of doing it, and I think Antonio mentioned another way. So, so maybe Ziad first. So Robert, as, as you know very well from your elegant work from Prepare Calc, when we focus our attention to the most calcified segment angiographically, what we tend to do is an extremely good job of lesion preparation in the most calcified segment, but we then under-prepare the remainder of the lesion. So if you have five millimeters of severe calcification, but a 30 millimeter long lesion, we treat the five millimeters and leave the rest of the 30 millimeters alone. Then when we place our stent, our minimal stent area is remote from the maximum calcified segment. So our strategy is to deliver up to half of the pulses in the most angiographically calcified segment. We call that a power surge. And then we use pulse management to distribute the remainder of the shocks along the length of the lesion to make sure that we modify the calcium throughout. Antonio, I, I, it's an elegant description for Ziad. I'm not sure most of us do it like that. Maybe we should. What, what's your take? Do you tend to distribute most of the pulses there at the tightest uh, spot, or will you split some of the pulses along the length of the lesion? But uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate with Ziad for his uh, uh, description of the nodular calcium. I learned uh, something today. And it's really very important. Nodular calcium is not nodular calcium. There are types of nodular calcium. And this is a very important element to keep in mind. Uh, to answer your question, Bern, is uh, we uh, use uh, IVUS or OCT more IVUS because of expense uh, and uh, decide where to concentrate the action of the shock wave. So uh, we base uh, our uh, strategy according to the extension of the calcium uh, at the time you do the, uh, the shock wave. Uh, almost always do IVUS when you, we do shock wave, before and after. Thanks for that. Bobby, maybe just to hear from you uh, as we finish. Uh, I mean, you saw nicely in the cases the strengths and the limitations of the different intravascular imaging modalities. Uh, what's your take on intravascular imaging in these uh, type of lesions? Uh, will you uh, have a preference for one or another? Well, I, I think the most important takeaway for the audience should be to use something. I think that's sort of one through five. Use something. If you're not using anything, you're missing out on a whole host of information here. I think secondarily, it's a little bit about preference. Uh, there are some people who are going to be more comfortable with one versus the other interpretation, ease of use for your lab setup. So I don't feel strongly about there being one scientifically justifiable, you know, imaging uh, parameter over the other. Um, but I think most, most importantly, just use something. I have, I have a question for Ziad. Sometimes uh, uh, when we do extensive preparation, shock wave and high pressure balloons, we're a little bit uh, afraid to do OCT at the end before stenting because we had some cases where we had some pretty bad propagating dissection due to the contrast media injection. What do you think? We were unlucky or is some, something to be concerned? Um, that's a great point, Antonio. So in Illumion 4, if you recall, we allowed um, anti-grade wire escalation CTO uh, with, with uh, in the inclusion criteria. And um, our, our experience is that once you've prepared the vessel, the contrast will take the path of least resistance, which is the largest hole. Um, 
And so if you've done, if you've got a good lumen after, if you do a little test puff and you've got a good lumen, then uh, OCT is actually very safe. Of course, um, the fact that the vessel is also very heavily calcified and kind of glued together prevents an anti-grade uh, dissection from, from propagating, unlike in a CTO. So um, we haven't had a tremendous um, problem with it, Antonio, but we also haven't systematically studied it. And I um, am the first to suggest and agree with you that OCT has its hazards. Um, you get some beautiful pictures, but we wholeheartedly accept and acknowledge that you know, for example, in SCAD, it would be a big mistake to use OCT over IVIS. And as you very elegantly showed, for the vast majority of things, high definition IVIS is now extremely good. The one perhaps missing area of that is the inability to measure the thickness of the calcium, mm -hmm. which is where the major benefit and identifying mm -hmm. fractures is on OCT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you are your classification of nodular calcium is impossible with IVUS. <laughs> yes. yes. So um, I, think, yeah. I think in term, in the interest of time, unfortunately, yeah. we've run over slightly. Mm -hmm. And I think there was some uh, very important uh, learnings, the meticulous attention to detail, modify, check, repeat, modify, check, uh, repeat. I think use some form of intravascular imaging is, is a take home. How you combine uh, atherectomy with lithotripsy uh, will depend on the distribution of calcium. I'm sure it'll be impacted by your local reimbursement models. Um, but uh, so, some very important uh, take home uh, messages from that session. I thank uh, Ziad and Antonio in particular uh, for great cases and uh, Marie Claude for the co moderation and to all of our panelists for their excellent contributions. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> bye.